What's up everyone? Steve here and I'm the student ministry pastor here at Encounter Church and welcome to our Wednesday encouragement. First, I want to thank you for joining us and what I'm going to talk about today is the three scriptures that helped me overcome the orphan mindset. Now the orphan mindset, I define it as this. Everyone kind of has their own little definition and you may not even heard of this term, but an orphan mindset is someone who doesn't feel worthy of the father's love and is constantly seeking their value in other people, hobbies, and work. So, now, for me, the orphan mindset that I had, you know, I got, I got to go way back to when I was born, and I'm not going to draw out this long story of my life. I'm going to just give you quick snippets so you can have an idea of how I got to where I am today. So, I am, I am a product of a teenage pregnancy, if I can say it that way. And my parents were 18, they were still in high school, and they had me. And my mom died three years later in a tragic car accident. So my dad, 21, raised me for many years and before he got remarried at the, when I was at the age of 12. But during those years, you can imagine being a 21-year-old male raising a three-year-old son that, you know, you can, Im you can just imagine. The, just, he tried his best, right? He, I, I feel like he did really well in a lot of areas. But when I was 12, he remarried, and this lady was, um, I'm not going to go into great detail, she was very abusive, mostly emotionally and verbally, and she always made me feel just terrible, just on a consistent basis, and it's like she'd always tell me I'm never good enough, she'd obviously use vulgar language, she was just very hostile towards, just, just a terrible person towards me, especially between 12 and 18 years old during these years, and my dad, Though I love my dad, father very much, he was very much engaged mostly in his work. He loved his work. He was not as active in my life in my teenage years as he was in early on. Though I know he tried his best. I love my father. We've repaired a lot of just a relationship. There's just some hurt and pain that I had. So when I got radically, I got kicked out of my house and I radically got saved at 18 years old. But my view of God from 18 to about 35, and this is, I also started ministry at the age of 24, so through 18 to 35 and 11 years of that was, I was a youth pastor and a senior pastor at the time. My view of God was, he was distant. I always felt like I need to prove something to him or show him that I can do something. Like I was like, hey God, look at me, I can do this. Like I always wanted to impress God. I don't, like it was just quite weird to even say it that way like looking back I'm like why would how but I feel like have you ever done that where you're just trying to like you do things go man I, I just want God to be proud of me and I always felt like I tried to get that from my father and him working a lot I always he was just kind of he was there but not there you know what I mean and I always viewed God that way and I was kind of like an orphan I always looked at God as like he's just high in the sky he though he loves me and I, I know he cares about me he's just he just wasn't around a whole lot, and that's how I kind of viewed God. And um, and then I always didn't feel worthy of His love, and I think a lot of it stemmed from just some of the verbal abuse I took from my from my from my uh, stepmom. And it was very hard to go through some of that and just trying to go, God, do you love me? Do you care? And you know, it's one of those things where you're always trying to seek affirmation from God. And I always tried to find it from other people. And, and sermons and things I did, I always would always come up to people going, hey, did you hear that? Was that good? And I always wanted like someone to say, is that good? And I still have a teeny bit of that in some of the things I do, but it is not even close to what it was. So I had this major orphan mindset. And at the age of 35, 36, I came across a man named Chad Norris. Uh, he's he's a good friend of Bill Johnson's and, and he's in those Finger God movies with Darren Wilson and He's a guy that kind of came in my life for the next two or three years. He would mentor me and he really shared a lot with me about this orphan mindset and just being loved by the Father. And it was a whole new concept about this relationship with God as Father. And I really struggled with it. I really didn't understand it. But he continued to prophesy over me, pour into me. I would read his books, study his, just his his sermons and we would text and we would call. He would fly out from South Carolina and hang out with me and visit with me and just really help me through this process of really knowing that I am loved by the Father and He deeply cares and He wants to be part of all my life and you don't have to put on this show that He literally loves you as a child. 
And as he began to speak those into me, and I'm telling you, it was a process. It was a lot of ground, hard ground to teal in my heart that I really just, just, it was just, as I said earlier, just, it was very difficult for me to grasp and understand. But, and I'll say this, I was more comfortable, and though my dad was very good to me, he was not abusive at all. I, I, I think I was more comfortable with a God that was um, harsh, judgmental, like, I would take a scripture like, almost like a police officer, I'd take a scripture and go, and man, it, like a scripture where he says, be afraid of, yes, he loves you, but be afraid of God who can also send your soul to hell. And I was also more comfortable, like, he's God, he's judge. And I didn't really, his love was more judgment. Does that, I hope that makes sense. It makes sense in my head. And that's how I kind of viewed it. But as I met with Chad, and I began to get into the word a little bit more, my eyes began to open up to a different view of who God is. With that said, I'm going to share, as I said, three scriptures that really helped me break free from an orphan mindset and just really embrace that the Father loves me and I don't need to perform for Him or, hey, look at me, Dad, look at what I did. And it's just more like He literally loves me and He absolutely cares about me and He's smiling on me, He's proud of me. Yes, I do disappoint Him sometimes, but I don't live in that shame and guilt. I absolutely know the Father loves me and I love Him. So the first one is found in 2 Samuel chapter 9. I'm not going to read the whole passage, the whole chapter, but it's one of my favorites. And it's the story of David showing kindness to Mephibosheth. Now, I'm going to I butcher that name sometimes, so do not comment below saying how to pronounce it or come to me in church and say, this is how you pronounce it. But it's Mephibosheth to me. And with him, he was Jonathan's son. Now, Jonathan was a great friend of David. And David becomes king and Saul has passed away. So... Usually when a king came, the new came in power, he usually wiped out the, next, the, the, the previous family. Wanted nothing else to do with them. But David cha- like, had this pact and this covenant with Jonathan. Like, I'm going to show kindness to Jonathan's family. So there was a son still alive. His name was Mephibosheth. He lived in um, Lodibar, which is the land of desolation. He was dropped as a kid. He was crippled and he had an orphan mindset. So David comes on the scene and, and goes, hey, and goes to a guy named Ziba, like, is there someone still around? He goes, yes, Mephibosheth. And he comes in contact with Mephibosheth and it says this. As David shows up, he says, greetings, Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth replied, I am your servant. And this is verse 6. And verse 7 says this. David says, don't be afraid. I intend to show kindness to you because you, of, your, of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul. And you will eat here with me at the king's table. Now think about what's happening. Like David is showing complete kindness to someone he does not know. And as part of the, his the former king's family. And he's like, I'm going to show kindness to you. And Mephibosheth bowed respectfully and exclaimed, who is your servant that you should show such kindness to a dead dog like me? And that was the orphan mindset that's literally showing like, why would God be good to me? Why would God be kind to me? Why would God love me? Why would God show me grace? Why would God show me mercy? And we have this mindset sometimes like, who am I? Well, you are worthy. God absolutely loves you and finds worth in saving you and loving you. And it's the same thing. We have that mindset as Mephibosheth had. Then the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and said, I have given you your master's grandson, everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and servants are to farm the land for him to to produce food for your master's household. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, will eat here at my table. Think about that. Mephibosheth not only gets all these blessings and inheritance and this is yours and hey, take care of them. He's literally saying, you get to sit at my table and eat. That is powerful what's happening here. And Ziba replied, yes, my Lord King, I am your servant. I will do all that you have commanded. And from that time on, Mephibosheth ate regularly at David's table like one of the king's own sons. And that, in my room, in my, in my office, I have this word board and that's literally the scripture I have that I wrote on it says and Mephibosheth ate regularly at the king's table because I find that so powerful that Mephibosheth this crippled man that has no worth in himself and no value in himself is literally getting to sit at the king's table and it's opened my eyes that as a son no matter 
how crippled I feel, how broken I feel, or how unworthy I feel of God's love, He has allowed me to sit at His table and eat with Him and fellowship with Him and be a part of His family. And I find that so powerful and so amazing. And the next scripture is found in Ephesians 1. This one is pretty awesome in itself, and it's, it's also another one of my favorites. It's Ephesians 1 verse 4 says this, Even before He made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in His eyes. Think about this. Even before the world was created, God chose us. Think about it. Before He made anything, He chose us and loved us. In verse 5 it says, God decided in advance to adopt us into His own family by bringing us to Himself through Jesus Christ. And this is my favorite part. This is what He wanted to do and it gave Him great pleasure. I find that absolutely astounding. I, I remember in my late 30s, look, like I used to I've read this scripture a billion times from the age of 18 to 36, 37, 35 years old. And I just look at this going, when my eyes were open, I was like, God, we were on God's mind even before He created everything. He absolutely is in love with us and wants to be with us. That He's going, man, I take, and it's not only that. Sometimes I feel like I used to have the mindset that God just did things just to do things. Like he's just, this is my task today. It's almost like a to-do list. I'm going to save my people today. But this, but when Paul writes this, he's saying, this is what he wanted to do and it gave him great pleasure. Absolutely just melts my heart because I'm sitting there going, he loves us. <laughs> this is what he wants to do. He wants to be with us for eternity and have relationship with sinful human beings. And it's, it should literally, if just reading that scripture, you just put a smile on your face. And just to remember that God literally chose you in advance to be part of His family is astounding. And then my favorite one so much that I have a tattooed on the back of my calf um, is Psalm 18. And in Psalm 18, it talks about um, God literally coming down and roaring down. Like it's the metaphor and descriptions that, that um, David uses in the, in the Psalms in Psalm 18 is so powerful. And I, I just read the whole thing. I'm not going to go through it because it's pretty long. But it's talking about the power of God and how he's coming down. He's seeing. But it says this in verse 16. He reached down from heaven and rescued me. He drew me out of deep waters. The pages are stuck together. And he rescued me from my powerful men, enemies and those who hated me. And then he goes to verse 19, and this is the part I just love. He said, he led me to a place of safety. He rescued me because he delights in me. That, I'll never forget, I was sitting in, in, the, in my, on my deck in my backyard when I first came across this passage. Once again, I probably read it a thousand times. But as God began to open my eyes, he rescued me because he delights in me. He saw me drowning, empty and broken, and this powerful Father rescued me because He delights in me. Like He literally delights in me. And sometimes I used to have this ragamuffin mindset that I'm just never good enough. I'm not going to be good enough, or or even. Even when Paul says, I am the chief of sinners, and like it's good to have that mindset of who you are. You're just a vapor. You're really just, you're just a human being. But you also have value. And he absolutely delights in you. And, I, and even having my own children, I've come to this understanding. And sometimes when my kids are just doing something, and they're 16 and 20 now, there's things I see him do and I'll just look at them and I just delight my kids. I love my kids and they're really not doing anything special and my kids have their own shortcomings and failures and successes and victories and there, there's not a moment I just go, yeah, I don't love them today. Or, man, they're doing something really good today that, hey, man, I love them more. My love is the same for them. 
whether they fail or whether they succeed. And I absolutely delight in my kids. And I think it's something I've learned from the father that I get to sit at the king's table. He, he takes great pleasure in, in rescuing me and loving me and choosing me to be a part of his family. And then he delights in me. And it's something that I hope the body of Christ and those listening can, can understand and get a grip of that all those three, three things are true for you also. You don't have to be an orphan. You're absolutely loved by the Father. And I just want to pray for you. If you feel in that orphan spirit right now, orphan mindset, I just want, I just want to just kind of just, just, just close your eyes and we'll just pray. Father, I just thank you so much for your goodness and grace. Those listening that just have that orphan mindset, I just pray that they would come to understand that they get a seat at the king's table, that you take great pleasure in choosing them and loving them, and you rescue them because you delight in them. Father, I thank you for your grace and mercy, and I pray that this penetrates people's hearts and minds, that they are loved, forgiven, and free. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi there, I'm Pastor Reese Bowling, the lead pastor here at Encounter Church, and you've been watching one of our Wednesday night encouragement messages, and I pray that it was a blessing to you. I also want you to know that, that if you'd like to become a part of a church fellowship, maybe you don't have a church home right now, uh, we are not only an online community, but we're also an in-person community. Our in-person services are at 9 and 11 on Sunday mornings, right here at the Encounter Church location, 6825 Galena Street in Centennial, Colorado. Uh, in addition, we want to make available to you resources that would be a blessing to you. And you can contact us about those resources simply by emailing us at ec at ecdenver.org or calling the church office at 303-771-0202. But I do want to speak to a very particular group of people who are watching this right now. Maybe you're someone who has never actually ask Jesus to become your personal Lord and Savior. Uh, you've never gone to God and saying, God, I, I really, I, I, I'm sorry for how I've been living my life. I want to change. I believe in Jesus and, and I want him to, to not only forgive me, but I want him to lead me and to help me make better decisions. And if that's you I'm talking to right now, I want you to know that that transformation, that moment in your life is critical to your future. And if you haven't made that decision yet, all you have to do right now is wherever you're watching this or listening to this, just pray this prayer. Say, dear God, I believe in you and I believe in Jesus. And I know I've made a lot of mistakes in my life, but I wanna change. And I, I want not only your forgiveness for the things I've done wrong, but I wanna make you my Lord and Savior. I, I, I wanna move forward following you. And I ask for your help in Christ's name I pray, amen. You know, if you prayed that prayer, uh, I'm excited for you because I know that God is about to do some great things in your life. And we'd also like to partner with you on this, this new journey in Christ. And to do that, again, all you need to do is email us at ec at ecdenver.org and just tell us what happened. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you in person or online here at Encounter Church Denver.